Hey guys, this is going to be a quick video looking at some of the important differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and some really cool mnemonics and tips to help you kind of remember which of the histological and pathological features of each goes with which one so that you don't get them mixed up. There's a lot of questions in QBanks on these two diseases, so it's important to keep all of this stuff straight. So let's get right into this. The first one we're going to talk about is ulcerative colitis. Now the first thing to know about ulcerative colitis that as far as what I think right away is I look at ulcerative, the U in ulcerative and the C in colitis and that helps me think of under the colon. U for under, C for colon. Well what does that tell you? Well that tells you that the damage will always start at the rectum. And the rectum is located under the colon and another name for the colon is the large intestine. And basically the damage is a sub, is a mucosal a mucosal and submucosal ulceration. Well, what does that mean? Well, okay, so here's a part of the bowel. So basically when you're looking at the bowel, the wall of the bowel, so this is the lumen right here of the bowel, you have kind of four main layers, and this is going from inside to outside that I'm gonna write these. You have the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis mucosae and the cirrhosis. So this is kind of like the muscular layer. This is the most inner layer and then going from there. Okay, so the damage is happening here. So it's, it's an ulceration of the mucosa and submucosa uh, layers. Okay, so that's the specific damage. Another important thing to know when we look at this is that if the damage always must start at the rectum area, it, it is, first of all, it's continuous damage. That means that it's not going to have a little bit of inflammation and then skip an area and then have a little bit of inflammation and then another area is okay. That's not how this works. The damage of ulcerative colitis must start at the rectum and then if it were to proceed farther down the bowel, it is a, in a continuous damage kind of section like this. But another really important thing to know is that the damage can never pass into the small intestine. The damage is only possible to cover up into the entire area of the colon, but it will never enter into the small intestine. And that's a really important distinguishing factor for ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay, so uh, let's get into the next picture. This is what's called a lead pipe appearance on x-ray, and let me show you why. Do you notice, first of all, that this is, let's say that this is the transverse part of the colon, the transverse segment, and I want you to notice those little ridges that you see all along, which, are, which is a normal appearance. These little ridges that you see when you're drawing out the intestine is what's called the hostra, and that's these little invaginated wrinkled areas, and that's a normal appearance of the uh, colon, of the large intestine. Okay, what happens in ulcerative colitis is because we're having ulceration of the two inner layers, you imagine that there's damage right here that's eating away these two inner layers. And what that does is that blunts this area, that blunts these invaginations or these hostra. So what you end up getting then on an x-ray is this. Look at the damage area of, in the ulcerative colitis situation. You see how there's no hostra. It's completely flat right here. That's called a lead pipe image. Now you may be thinking, well why is it flat right there and then up in the other part of the, um, the colon in the transverse segment it it's, um, still has the hostra present. The reason is because remember I said that ulcerative colitis starts, must always start in the rectum and can move up and it has the possibility of going all the way through the bowel, but it can stop anywhere it wants to in the inflammatory situation of it. So basically in this patient, they have ulcerative colitis that has only gone up into uh, all the way from the rectum and then up to the, the very beginning of the descending right here at the descending uh, colon. And so it's gone, basically the ulcerative colitis is all the way through this part and it started down here in the rectum part, okay? So then, but this part, and from on, all the way on then, is all normal, okay? So that's, that's kind of how ulcerative colitis can present. It will always happen in the rectum first, and then it will move up in a continuous manner all the way up, and then whenever, whenever, whichever section happens to stop in, there will be no more inflammation after that healthy segment, okay? So that's called the lead pipe appearance on x-ray. The next thing I want to show you is this is showing the continuous, this is looking within, let me uh, get a different color here so because I know red wouldn't show up on that picture very well. So when you look at this picture, this is looking into the bowel 
And just to remind you, these are the layers again. This is going to be the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis mucosa, and the serosa. So we know that the first two layers are having ulceration. Notice that the entire area, this is continuous, all of this is under ulceration. And what that ends up doing is if you destroy the entire area of a bowel, like the entire section, whichever is being destroyed, you're then destroying all of the cell cells of that epithelium from the mucosa and submucosa, and you're destroying every possible connection to each individual cells. Well, what does that mean? What that means is that when you look at this picture, you can see what's known as friability or something that's friable, friability. That means that if you were to basically take your fingernail and scratch against this, some of this stuff would flake off and come off. This is just basically barely sitting on the surface of the lumen. That's because unlike in the case of Crohn's disease, in Crohn's disease, you have you have damaged segmental and then it's a healthy section, then damage some more, and then we move on, then there's maybe some damage some more. That's in Crohn's disease. But in this patient, you have continuous damage all the way through. So what that means is that there is no sort of um, connection, cell, cellular adhesion connections between the various cells of the epithelium to be able to hold on to the wall around it. So the, basically the cells just, the cells just kind of slough off if you were to scratch a certain area of it. And that's what's called friability, and that's unique to ulcerative colitis. Another important thing to know is remember I said when you're looking, uh, let me go back to the other picture, when you're looking at the, the breakdown of the colon, I said that the damage always starts here, right? It always starts in the rectum, and then it has the ability to go up, and if it wants to, it can go all the way through the bowel, and if it doesn't want to, it can stop basically wherever it wants. What that's basically giving you is the fact that you're kind of more localized to the right side. So if this was a person, sorry, I'm terrible at drawing, and you were looking at their abdomen down here, right? You know that you have a left upper, a left lower, a right upper, and a right lower quadrant. You could, you could basically say that the damage is all localized to the left side. Why is that important? Because this, this uh, disease kind of presents with left lower quadrant pain, left lower quadrant pain. That, that can be distinguished from Crohn's disease, and I'm going to show you why as far as where Crohn's disease presents later on. So left lower quadrant pain, that's a distinguishing characteristic for ulcerative colitis. In most cases, you can have weird cases where Crohn's could present with left lower quadrant, but it's far more rare. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. Um, also, going back to this picture, there's something very unique about ulcerative colitis that I want you to know. Because ulcerative, um, yeah, I'm just going to use this picture. Because ulcerative colitis has this continuous damage, and because the damage, when you're looking at a tube, so say we're looking down the tube, here's in here is the lumen, and then this is all the wall out here. So this is the mucosa, this is the submucosa, the muscularis mucosa, and the serosa. Because we're only having damage, let's say, ulceration all the way to the submucosa and none past that, what that means is that you're having the potential, because of this ulceration inflammation, inflammatory cells will then enter, can go from the lumen as far down as the damage is. And what just happens to be down here in this muscularis mucosa level, right below the mucosa and submucosa, it happens to be the crypts. The crypts. Do you remember learning about intestinal crypts? Intestinal crypts. You can have small intestinal crypts and you can have large intestinal crypts. And the large intestinal crypts normally go by the name, just kind of a general name, colonic uh, crypts. What that means is that when you look at the histology um, of the bowel, for example, you have these glands. And these glands can penetrate down, starting up here, even at the very top sometimes, at the mucosa and submucosa. And then they kind of draw the line right about that, right at the point where the muscularis mucosa starts. And then, the, of course, the serosis down here. So these crypts are, of course, going to be damaged by the mucosa and because the mucosa and submucosa is having ulceration. What does that mean? Well, all of these inflammatory cells that result, result from this inflammation is going to go down and is basically going to sit at the bottom where this, this crypt is. The, basically, the, ver the crypt is like the very bottom of this little gland, this thing going down. Okay, and what do you end up getting? You'll get something called crypt abscesses. And the abscesses, the abscess just forms because all these inflammatory neutrophils, uh, PMNs, remember polymorphonucleotide uh, neutrophils, uh, 
all of these neutrophils basically just go and kind of sit at the bottom because all of these upper layers have been eaten away by ulceration and so you get a collection of neutrophils sitting down here in the crypts. That's called crypt abscesses and that is um, diagnostic for ulcerative colitis. Okay. Uh, one last thing that I want to let you know, uh, actually two or three little more points. Um, these are two things that I really can't explain well, but I have kind of a comical way to remember it. So what I do is I know that using the letters U and C, you know that we said that that stands for under the colon. And so the damage always starts at the rectum. And we know with rectum, that's obvious where you're going to, if you have to go to the bathroom, you defecate, right? So I think of the word poop, which has two P's. Okay, and those two P's will signify two more important features that are uh, diagnostic for this disease as far as in comparison to Crohn's disease. The first one stands for P. Anka. See, P. And that just stands for paranuclear antibody, um, basically against the neutrophil. So when you look at a cell, you can use certain immunofluorescence and say this was the nucleus right here, okay, however the nucleus may look. Basically, you're going to see that this part is going to be immunofluorescent, it's going to be lit up. That's going to be P onca positive. Now, in comparison, you can have something that's C onca positive, which this thing is not. This is P onca. But in C onca positivity, let's say this is the nucleus, the part that's going to be lit up is all up in here. C stands for cytoplasm. So cytoplasm onca, that, so the antibody is going to be lit up, immunofluoresced here in the cytoplasm, whereas in P onca, it's going to be lit up. That stands for perinuclear. So here's the nucleus. And so around, peri means around or neighboring. So that part's going to be lit up. Okay. So that's, so that's the first thing in our little mnemonic. If you can remember poop, obviously, if you remember rectum, that should kind of come to your mind. Okay. So P onca positivity. The next important thing uh, for the other P here is going to be that the, uh, this, you're prone to getting something called primary sclerosing cholangitis. Primary. And really, I wrote out this, but a, a one for and a little degree here sign for primary, but really you would write out primary like this. So the mnemonic works here. So P for P positive and P for primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Patients with this disease, and they actually have a lot of theories, but they have no idea why this is linked. It seems to be linked to this disease. Basically, in primary scler sclerosing cholangitis, say this is the patient's liver. You have intrahepatic ducts that go through and transfer things around the liver. And then right outside the liver, you have more kind of ducts. These are extra Intrahepatic. So this is intrahepatic and this is extrahepatic ducts. And what you have in this disease in primary sclerosing cholangitis is you have these segmented areas of sclerosing or thickening or fibrosis. This is like scar tissue. And it seems to be segmented in areas where the damage is more so. And this is this is what defines the disease. You have this sclerosing or fibrosing thickening in the intra and extrahepatic ducts of the liver and it's segmented, okay? So that's a disease that often is associated with ulcerative colitis. And then the very last point for this disease, and this is something really strange, but this is the way that I think about it. In ulcerative colitis, Smoking, this is really strange, smoking actually is protective, somewhat protective. Now I'm going to show you my reasoning for why I think that's the case. First of all, th there's some research sh that shows that smoking can increase mucus production. Okay, can increase mucus production. Well, where does mucus production come as far as when we're talking about the bowel? Remember I said there's a mucosa, a submucosa, muscularis mucosa, and a serosa. The mucosa is, the mucus is actually coming the most right here in the mucosa. Some in the submucosa, but you can say mostly in the mucosa. So what is that going to do? If there's tons of mucus right here, you can imagine that that's protective for further inflammatory infiltrate and damage, right? So that right there kind of explains the protective mechanism. But what it doesn't explain is the fact that in Crohn's disease, smoking actually makes the situation worse. And the reason I think about that is this. In um, ulcerative colitis, if this is our vessel, remember that the, the um, ulceration only happens from the mucosa and the submucosa, but as far as the muscularis mucosa and the serosa, there's no damage. So the damage stops right here. Okay, so what that means is that if there were carcinogens and various things that can cause damage coming from cigarette smoke that have entered into the bloodstream after going from the lungs and being diffused over, 
you would imagine that that cigarette smoke could only get as far as the submucosa but could never penetrate down in the muscular submucosa and submucosa. So that just tells you that, that that's just kind of a way for me to remember that, okay, the, the other damages of smoking that you would expect to do to the, um, to the luminal wall of the colon is being blockaded because the damage, the, uh, dam the ulceration only goes as far as the submucosa. Okay. Oh yeah. And one last little point. I said that this disease has more uh, is more prone to primary sclerosis and cholangitis. This disease is also the one associated with increased adenocarcinoma risk. Increased adenocarcinoma risk. Why? Now, really simple way to remember this. First of all, remember I said that this always presents at the rectum first. So this is our little, let's say this is our large intestine right here. The damage always presents down here first and then has the ability to move up uh, the large intestine from there as far as it want to, whether it be all of it or even just up to a certain segment and then stop. Well, you have to remember a little fact, and that's just kind of something to remember that will help you remember this, is that small intestine, small intestine has practically practically zero chance for malignancy to occur there. Think about how many cases you've heard or how many times you've ever learned in your medical school that we're talking about a, a malignancy or an adenocarcinoma of the small intestine. It's practically non-existent other than maybe a few really, really rare cases. As a general rule, the, as far as cancer is concerned, we're more or less talking about um, the large bowel right here. The large intestine is where the, a lot of the cancers can take place. Well, if ulcerative colitis is confined to the large intestine, that means that this is the only one that has the possibility to increase adenocarcinoma risk. The reason being is because if we're looking at Crohn's disease, and we know that Crohn's disease um, just, we're going to talk about this later, but Crohn's disease is more pronounced in the terminal ileum. That's its most common spot, which is the small intestine. And then this has skip lesions, so this doesn't affect continuously. And because this is affecting more, more so in the small intestine, although it can affect anywhere in the GI tract, this is more pronounced in the small intestine. Because of this, the increased risk of cancer is very, very low con compared to ulcerative colitis. So in QBank questions, you'll see, if you see that they're describing some sort of inflammatory um, bowel problem, and they're talking about, you know, the typical symptoms, bloody diarrhea and, and abdominal pain, kind of, they could say left lower quadrant, right lower quadrant, but that's not always diagnostic. But um, basically, and they're, can they're pointing towards more of a, uh, the patient ended up getting cancer, you need to be thinking more of ulcerative colitis, okay? And those are uh, basically all the important points when looking at ulcerative colitis, okay? So let's move into the next one. Now that you have a general understanding of ulcerative colitis, we can jump into Crohn's disease and it should become a lot easier. I've already told you that ulcerative colitis had a continuous damage starting must that it always starts from the rectum and it can move up all the way through the bowel but cannot continue any on further. Now the difference here is in Crohn's disease, it's a segmental damage. What that means is that if this is now let's now we're gonna jump to the small intestine, right? So I'm just keeping this simple and I kept it straight. I know it's